Welcome to NYU Langone Insights on Psychiatry, a clinician's guide to the latest psychiatric research. I'm Dr. Thea Gallagher. Each episode, I interview a leading psychiatric researcher about how their work is shaping clinical practice. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Richard Davidson. Dr. Davidson is the founder and director of the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. A pioneer in the study of mindfulness and meditation, Dr. Davidson takes us through his recent work on the science of human flourishing, including a mobile app that provides personalized mental health supports. Dr. Davidson, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And um, we're just going to jump right in. So where does the research currently stand on mindfulness meditation as a mental health intervention? Uh, I would say, honestly, it stands uh, uh, at uh, its relative infancy. Uh, it's only really quite recently that contemplative practices, including mindfulness, have been explored as possible uh, either adjuncts or um, uh, treatments for individuals who are suffering from various kinds of psychiatric disorders. Uh, you know, these traditions arose uh, not to treat illness, but to promote awakening. Uh, uh, and so uh, it's really uh, only in the most recent sliver of human history that these methods that have been around really for more than 2,500 years are first being applied to individuals with uh, mental health issues. So we're still in the early stages. Um, uh, and I think that uh, uh, the media uh, sometimes portrays it as more advanced than it is. But, um, you know, I think that's where we are right now. Yeah. And it, um, it's, you know, I know you've had a number of studies in the last few years really looking at measuring and the mechanisms of kind of what mindfulness and meditation are doing in the brain, where are you currently focusing your research efforts? What we're most excited about right now, I, I should say, I should back up and just say that our center, the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, is a large interdisciplinary research center. There are about 75 people working in the center just to give a sense of scale, there's a lot going on that ranges from basic research in a laboratory to applied work in real-world settings. What I'm personally most excited about these days is the opportunity to scale well-being. Uh, I think most people would agree that the world can use a little bit more well-being. Um, uh, we're not flourishing as a species. There are all kinds of indicators that um, are raising red flags. For example, the Surgeon General of the United States issued a, a health advisory in April, last April, um, uh, on loneliness uh, as an urgent public health issue. Uh, and some people may be surprised to learn that loneliness is uh, a greater risk factor for mortality than smoking 15 cigarettes a day, mm -hmm. uh, and more than twofold the risk factor for premature mortality than is obesity. Uh, so these are characteristics that get under the skin, so to speak, affect our biology uh, in ways that are deleterious to our health. And so there's an urgent need to scale well-being. Uh, and um, we have the strong conviction that it's something that indeed can be done. We can use simple contemplative type practices. Uh, we can introduce them to large numbers of people. We can use uh, mobile health technologies to do that. And uh, we can also develop more effective measures of well-being so we can track the progress uh, to see uh, how these interventions are actually impacting individuals' well-being and their uh, their mental health. So that's what I'm really passionate about, and a lot of the work in our center is now focused on that. Yeah, and it, it sounds like you want to focus this work not only on maybe clinically depressed populations or clinically anxious populations, but also, quote-unquote, healthy populations. Is Is that what I'm getting as well, that this kind of well-being is something that everybody can benefit from? Uh, absolutely. We think of it as a 
very much as a universal intervention. We also think that if uh, people are honest with themselves, we're all suffering. Mm. Uh, we don't need to earn a formal diagnosis. I think that uh, uh, suffering is unfortunately so prevalent. And so uh, we also hold the view that decreasing or even eliminating symptoms of uh, psychiatric illness, like symptoms of anxiety or symptoms of depression, is not equivalent to flourishing. And so uh, strategies to treat these problems are important, but they don't go far enough. Um, every human being has the capacity to flourish, and flourishing is something more than simply not being depressed or not being anxious. And do you um, envision, and I know a lot of clinicians, psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, do use um, mindfulness and meditation kind of as a standard tool in their clinician toolkit. And in a lot of ways, um, you know, even mindfulness is kind of like can be almost a blanket over the work that a, a clinician is doing. But do you see this being a really important part of the therapeutic relationship and, and a really important part of therapy moving forward? Uh, I think it can be, yes. And I would also um, call attention to uh, uh, the importance of framing this more broadly than mindfulness. Mindfulness is one of several really important elements that are essential for human flourishing, but it's not the only one. Uh, and uh, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the work in, in the West uh, uh, in the incorporation of meditation methods into uh, um, therapy and other psychiatric interventions has uh, excessively focused on mindfulness. Uh, and I think, um, so we need to broaden it. There are other, there are hundreds of forms of meditation. Mindfulness is, is just one form. Uh, and uh, other forms may really be important for human flourishing. We, we know they are. Can you give some examples of some other forms that you're referring to? Sure. Uh, so, you know, I think at this point, it's helpful to introduce our framework for um, understanding the plasticity of well-being uh, or, or flourishing. Uh, we published this framework uh, in 2020, uh, and the framework holds that there are four key pillars of well-being, each of which uh, has specific neural correlates and biological um, correlates, uh, uh, and each of which is really essential in human flourishing. Uh, the first pillar we call awareness. Awareness is where mindfulness would be. Uh, it would include the capacity for self-awareness. Uh, it would also include the capacity for meta-awareness. And meta-awareness is the quality of knowing what our minds are doing. And to some listeners, that may sound a little strange. Don't we all always, don't we all know what our minds are doing? But uh, I wonder how many listeners have had the experience of reading a book where they're reading each word on a page, and they may read one page, they may read a second page, and after a few minutes, they have absolutely no idea what they've just read. Their mm -hmm. mind is lost. That's a good example of not knowing what our mind are do is doing, but the moment we recognize it is a moment of meta-awareness. It's a moment of awakening, and it turns out that could be trained. And there are some people walking around who are meta-aware all the time. Uh, and uh, meditation uh, uh, is something that can really help with that. So the second pillar of well-being we call connection. Connection is about qualities that are important for healthy social relationships, qualities like gratitude, appreciation, mm -hmm. kindness, compassion. And there are specific practices that are designed to cultivate these qualities. Uh, we know that... Um, uh, humans come into the world with a preference for kindness and cooperation compared to selfishness and aggression, for example. But in order for these preferences to really um, become robust qualities, they need to be nurtured. And uh, there is a long tradition of practices that are designed to nurture these. Uh, the third pillar we call insight. And insight is about uh, a curiosity-driven self-knowledge. And mm -hmm. it's really knowledge about the self. 
That is, we all of us have this entity that we construct in our minds called ourself. Uh, it's a narrative. It's a set of beliefs and a set of expectations about ourselves. And we know that uh, there are some people on, on the far end of a continuum who have very negative self-beliefs and very, very negative uh, or low expectations of themselves. And of course, that's a prescription for depression. And one of the insights from the contemplative traditions is that what's most important for well-being initially is not so much changing the narrative, but it's changing our relationship to the narrative mm -hmm. so that we're not hijacked by the narrative. We can actually see the narrative for what it is, which is a bunch of thoughts. Uh, it's not who we are. Uh, it's not our essence. Uh, it's really this construction. And when we're able to see it that way, it provides some leverage and uh, we can be less hijacked by this narrative. And finally, the last pillar of well-being is purpose. And mm. purpose is about identifying our sense of direction in life. Uh, it's about clarifying our values. And it's not so much about finding something more purposeful to do, but how can we find meaning and purpose in that which we are already doing, including the pedestrian activities of daily living? Can uh, taking out the garbage be deeply connected to your sense of purpose? Mm. And of course it could be. Uh, mm -hmm. It just mm -hmm. requires a little bit of reframing. And again, there are simple meditation practices designed to do this. So unfortunately in the West, most people equate meditation with mindfulness. You know, the Dalai Lama, for example, doesn't, doesn't do mindfulness meditation. That's really not um, the kind of practice that he typically does. Uh, and um, uh, there are just uh, these rich um, practices that are part of these traditions that have received much less attention in the West, but are um, really critical for promoting human flourishing. I often use the metaphor of um, if you just focus on mindfulness, it would be like going to the gym and just working out on your upper body. You know, it'd be mm. good for your upper body, but uh, if that's all you're doing, after a while, it's going to actually lead to some imbalance. Mm -hmm. And is, uh, you know, from your research, do you feel like, is there a certain amount of time to be spent in meditation that kind of makes these pillars more reinforced or kind of practiced or real? Like, is, um, you know, meditation, I'm, I'm thinking meditation versus like living your life. Um, what's kind of, is there a sense of how much time should be spent in kind of meditation practices? Yeah, it's a very important question. And uh, I should say that we have um, developed a curriculum uh, called the Healthy Minds Program that incorporates each of these four pillars of well-being. And we've put it into a mobile app called the Healthy Minds Program, and it's totally free. Uh, it's freely available wherever you get apps. And the New York Times Wirecutter named it as one of the three best meditation apps for 2023. Uh, and it's uh, produced by a nonprofit organization that I founded uh, that's affiliated with our university center called uh, Healthy Minds Innovations. And we've done research, and it turns out that uh, people don't need to do a lot to begin to see real benefit. If you practice uh, even as short as four to five minutes a day, and you can sprinkle this throughout your day, just doing one minute here, two minutes there, wow. um, over the course of 30 days, that could that actually, um, from randomized controlled trials uh, that we've done and published, show a uh, huge benefit in reducing symptoms of anxiety and depression and promoting well-being. And um, one of the ways I often talk about this is to remind listeners that when human beings first evolved on this planet, none of us were brushing our teeth. Mm. Uh, and today, uh, virtually everyone on the planet brushes their teeth. And uh, it's something we do for our personal physical hygiene. And the data show that if we spent even as short a time as we do brushing our teeth, nourishing our mind, this world would really be a different wow. place. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's very promising and exciting and also very accessible. Um, Some of the other episodes we've had are talking about research that's really exciting, but we're not going to see um, kind of being able to be utilized for another 10 years likely, or, you know, it's going to take time. So um, it must make this work exciting for you as well to see benefits, to see something that's also um, like relatively accessible to all. Yes, absolutely. And that's why we made the crazy decision to uh, release our app completely freely to remove any kind of financial barrier so that it is as widely accessible as possible. Yeah. And, you know, do you have any sense of what's happening in the brain during meditation that makes it so powerful um, and, you know, in kind of such a small dose? Uh, Well, we have some inklings. And first, um, we can't use the word meditation as if it refers to one thing. As we were discussing earlier, there are many different forms of meditation, and it turns out different forms of meditation do different things to the brain. That's quite well established by now. Uh, So mindfulness meditation is very different than meditation on compassion. Um, And uh, uh, in turn, both of those are very different than meditation that's focused on insight. Uh, So different forms of meditation do different things. Broadly speaking, we can say that meditation is influencing major networks in the brain, particularly the default network, the salience network, and the central executive network. Those are three networks in the brain that consistently are affected by different forms of meditation in different ways, depending upon the nature of the practice. And then would you say also that, um, can can you explain also how this differs maybe from MBSR or mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is like a more formal program, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, I mean, MBSR or mindfulness-based stress reduction is, um, I mean, I it's a great um, program that uh, we have studied extensively in our own lab. Uh, it's a program first developed by John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. It's a program that I have enormous amount of respect for. It's taught at um, all most academic medical centers in the U.S. and Europe, um, as well as other places in the world, too. Uh, and, and it's an eight-week program uh, uh, that's um, very accessible. I wouldn't call it any more or less formal than our Healthy Minds program. Our Healthy okay. Minds program is also a formal program. Mm-hmm. Um, it just uh, is a lot less time intensive um, uh, because we're really trying to meet um, uh, people where they are. And um, most people cannot comply with the um, assignment in MBSR to practice 45 minutes a day for six, six days a week. Um, You know, if you ask people, uh, six months after they take an MBSR course, how many of you are practicing 45 minutes a day, six days a week? I think the percentage is very close to zero. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, our interest is in getting people on a path where they can do something regularly every day. Uh, and uh, where, um, and that for that reason, uh, the bar is much lower. But you also think the bar being lower, but the um, effects are, would you say, longer lasting or the effects are or it's just maybe more sustainable because of the, you know, I think time is the four letter word in our society. So is there part of that that like the reduction of the time commitment might have more longevity for for like, you know, again, a formal program, but less time intensive? Yeah, those are great questions. And really, the most honest answer is we don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Because uh, they've never been directly pitted against one another, so to speak, in a randomized controlled trial with long-term follow-up. And in order to really scientifically address the question you're asking, that would be required. Uh, And uh, that's never been done. Uh, you know, it would be interesting to do at some point. I think both programs have their place uh, and their value. Uh, uh, someone may start with our Healthy Minds program and do 
four to five minutes a day and find that they want more um, uh, and that it's really resonating with them. And at that point, they may go to uh, a mindfulness-based stress reduction course and really get a lot out of it. So, uh, you know, I think that they can work uh, in a very synergistic and complementary way. Yeah. Um, and kind of building on this kind of the research, it looks like in in 2022, you co-authored this paper that said, you know, that you didn't find structural changes in the brain in subjects who had completed the eight-week course of MBSR. So what conclusions do you draw from this about maybe MBSR's effectiveness or um, even, I don't know if it applies, if you feel like it applies also to healthy minds? What what do you make of this idea that maybe there aren't structural changes happening? Yeah, so um, I'm, first of all, thank you for asking that question and referring to that that article. That was, uh, I think, an important article. It appeared in a high-profile journal. And um, uh, I think that it it is a useful corrective to some of the hype, um, particularly in the popular media, about structural changes in the brain with short amounts of meditation. I don't think the Healthy Minds program uh, over the course of two months would structurally change the brain either. Mm-hmm. So it's not that MBSR is, quote, right. worse or better. Um, I, you know, I don't think any uh, meditation practice that is uh, at these early stages, you know, with just um, uh, a total of, uh, um, you know, in the case of MBSR, it's, you know, roughly 30 hours over the course of uh, eight weeks. You know, I don't think that's the the data show that it's not enough to structurally change the brain. On the other hand, we do know that longer term practice does change the brain. Mm. Um, so there's no doubt that there could be structural changes in the brain. Uh, it just is going to require more practice. Uh, and so um, we don't know what the parameters are uh, that lead to structural changes. I also suspect that they're big individual differences in this. And also uh, the nature of the structural changes matters. So what Mm -hmm. we are looking at in the 2022 paper that you are mentioning are volume changes and um, cortical thickness changes. And there are other kinds of structural changes, for example, changes in the integrity of the white matter. And we have data that we've published showing that MBSR does change. Uh, white matter uh, in eight weeks. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it really depends on which structural changes you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is, if people are identifying a benefit, like in, say, a self-report measure, are they saying that they find that their life is maybe more manageable or they feel more positive symptoms or, you know, more positivity and they feel better does there do there have to be structural changes for it to be beneficial? I guess. No, I don't think mm-hmm. there does have to be structural changes, and that's a really critical question. And um, we know that MBSR produces functional changes in the brain. Uh, we know that even really short amounts of practice produce functional changes in the brain, way shorter than MBSR. Uh, and uh, so the benefits that people are reporting likely have to do with functional changes in the brain. Uh, And those functional changes are really important and they underlie uh, the immediate benefits that people are reporting. So uh, uh, the structural changes I think are important for the effects to endure uh, over a longer period of time, but uh, they're not necessary for the immediate benefit that people experience. Mm-hmm. Which I think sounds almost hopeful, you know, that you can do something and maybe it will take time to change um, things structurally, but you can still experience benefits pretty quickly um, in a short time frame. Um, Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. And, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, you're really you're really passionate about mindfulness and meditation and these pillars you're talking about. Um, I think sometimes for clinicians, it's something that kind of is, like you said earlier, maybe an adjunctive that they're adding to the work that they're doing. 
would you recommend that more clinicians maybe lead with mindfulness and meditation practices or have that be not just integrated or, you know, an adjunctive, but really a core part of the treatment that they're doing with with every individual? Yeah, um, another really wonderful question. It's complicated. I think that, um, first of all, if they're going to do that, I think they need to have their own practice. Mm -hmm. Um, You can't teach this stuff if you don't do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, It needs to come from an authentic embodied place uh, because a lot of the uh, teaching is really through, almost through social learning through, uh, it, it's kind of an osmotic process, if you will. And uh, it is through a, an embodied demeanor that the clinician can impart to her or his client or patient um, the nature of these qualities. So uh, that's the first thing. And I would strongly encourage all clinicians to have a meditation practice. I think it's a great benefit. And uh, in fact, to me, it's almost inconceivable to be a mental health provider if you don't have a practice. Mm. You know, if I were uh, in charge of uh, of training curricula, I would have this be a mandatory piece uh, mm-hmm. of training um, yeah. because I think it is so essential. So if if they do have that practice, then yes, I think that it would be a great thing to include on a regular basis, not just uh, as an adjunct, but uh, as a more formal component of the methods that they use. And there's a growing um, evidence base for the efficacy of these kinds of methods, specifically um, with patients who are suffering from various kinds of psychiatric mm-hmm. illnesses. Yeah. You know, and then in the, you know, a lot of the work that I do with like exposure and response prevention for OCD, if you don't have OCD, it's kind of hard to, you know, have an exposure practice in your life, Um, even though I try to put myself in some situations that would activate me. So I kind of get a sense of what that might be like for my patients. But um, I think this is a really great way also that we can kind of relate and build that connection of humanity with our patients that we can all benefit from. Um, mindfulness and various meditation practices. Yeah, I I agree. And I think it's so important. And I think, uh, again, going back to our earlier discussion, I think if we're all honest with ourselves, you know, all of us are suffering in one way or another. And uh, uh, we all can benefit from a greater sense of well-being and flourishing. I know you're working kind of to develop these algorithms that are, you know, kind of delivering these micro supports. Can you tell us a little bit more about this project? Yeah. So um, uh, this is really a further extension of uh, some of the issues that we were discussing earlier um, uh, about the accessibility of these practices. You know, there are surveys that have been done of people who were just asked if they are engaging in any specific practice to cultivate their own well-being, broadly defined, whether it's meditation, yoga, you know, many different things that people might do to benefit their own well-being. And um, pretty consistently in surveys done, at least in Western countries, what you find is that there's not more than around 15% of the population that's actively doing something to cultivate their own well-being. 85% are not. And of those 85%, a large fraction don't even have the recognition that well-being is something that can actually be improved Mm. or be learned. Um, So, uh, and, you know, people like me uh, often find themselves in front of the already converted, so to speak, you know, people who already drank the Kool-Aid. But, you know, frankly, I'm much more interested these days in spending time with the other 85%. Uh, And that's why we're working with people like police and firefighters and, you know, employees who are at call centers and stuff like that. These are people who might never have heard of these kinds of practices. And uh, we are exploring ways in which we could be of some benefit. Uh, And this is where micro supports come in. And, uh, an example of a micro support, are, it's really a very short practice 
that can be seamlessly integrated with your everyday life. And by short, I mean one minute or less. Mm. And so an example of this is, this is an example from research we did during COVID with public school teachers in the United States, where we invited them to reflect on their purpose in becoming a teacher for one minute before they start the day. Spend one minute reflecting on your purpose. And it turned out that a very large fraction of teachers reported that this was an elixir for their soul. Wow. Uh, that they, they got completely disconnected from their sense of purpose. And this simple invitation for one minute was really powerful in helping them navigate the challenges that they were facing. And we do this several times a day. We sprinkle it in. Another example of a micro support is before an important meeting with a group of colleagues or coworkers, spend one minute reflecting on something positive that each of these individuals have, has done over the last month. Just reflect on something positive that they've done. And it's amazing how one minute doing that can change the entire tenor of a meeting. These are examples of micro supports. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to meditate. You just have to be willing to engage with these micro supports. You don't have to sit in any special posture. You don't have to be in any special place. You can do this as you're navigating your everyday life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, in some of my work with burnout and workplace wellness, I get some pushback sometimes about these kind of interventions. Like you're not, you know, how can this solve the bigger problem maybe of feeling overworked and undersupported? Or how also can it help if, you know, with all of the global crises that are ongoing? What What's your take kind of on like micro interventions being powerful, but then maybe some of these larger systemic issues? How do they interact or relate? Yeah, so I think that's super important, and it's really important to recognize that there are these systemic injustices, uh, and they do uh, affect our well-being. It's not either or. Mm. So that's the primary answer. It's not either or. It's got to be both. Mm -hmm. Because if you are totally burned out, you will have your vitality sapped, uh, and you won't be an effective social change agent. We need people who are operating on all cylinders in order to change the systemic injustices that we're all facing. And so it's got to be both. And so framing it as either or is really, I think, the wrong kind of framing. And it seems like you think there's a correlation between mindfulness and meditation and ultimately feeling more whole and having maybe more energy to engage um, in larger change. And specifically, I know that you feel passionately about pro-sociality. Um, and so even though a lot of these practices seem pretty individual, how do you hope they translate into greater, you know, social connection? Yeah. So, uh, again, really important. And, um, the role of social connection is huge. It is, you know, one of our four key pillars of well-being. We know it's intimately connected to well-being and flourishing. And one of the convictions that we have, and there's data to support this, uh, and that is that nurturing connection will help in real social connection and engaging in social connection um, uh, meaningful social relationships will in turn help nurture these qualities. It's, it's bi-directional. And so I think that uh, this is something that really um, uh, is uh, important and the data speak to the value of these practices in nurturing real social connection that can combat loneliness. Yeah, and just the image, in, you know, in my mind that we use a lot, but like you kind of can't pour from an empty cup. So almost being able to, the more you can nurture the the aspects of your humanity that seem to lead to flourishing and thriving, they can then lead to um, community engagement, whether that's in your familial community or a larger work community or even, you know, a global community. Right. 
So, you know, in my final question, where do you hope, um, you know, to see the research go in the future? What are you what are you hoping for? What do you hope to see in the next five to 10 years with the work that you're doing? Well, uh, I, there are a few things. One is uh, we, I think, will have much better measures of well-being that uh, we can um, track on a more granular basis. Uh, this can provide us with important information to provide micro supports in the moment uh, in a context appropriate way uh, that can really be of great benefit. I also see the possibility of massive scaling. Uh, one of the dreams I have is of a flourishing city where we can work with a city uh, with uh, a number of key sectors simultaneously. For example, healthcare, education, first responders, communities of faith, uh, city government and the workplace. We, we've worked with all of those sectors individually, but we've never worked with all those sectors simultaneously. Uh, and if we can um, bring this to a mid-sized city, for example, we can look at distal outcomes that really matter that we think are mediated by well-being. So what would ex an example of a distal outcome be? A distal outcome might be crime rate in the city suicide rate, life expectancy, healthcare costs, all of those are targets that we actually believe can be moved when a sufficiently large fraction of the population is nourishing their mind in addition to brushing their teeth. Yeah, and um, it's such inspiring and exciting work that is accessible to all, which is, I, th I think it's pretty rare um, in the work many psychiatrists are doing. So thank you so much for sharing this work with us. And um, you've not only shared it on this podcast, but with your Healthy Minds app that everybody can download and utilize. Um, and so thank you so much, Dr. Davidson, for all of this great information. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be with you. Thanks so much for that conversation, Dr. Davidson. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate and subscribe to NYU Langone Insights on Psychiatry on your podcast app. For the Department of Psychiatry at NYU Langone, I'm Dr. Thea Gallagher. See you next time.